here we are in Washington, D.C. the day to fall. There's a, a commercial about the most interesting man in the world. Well, in my world, if someone asked me who was one of the most interesting people I've ever met in my life, I'd have to honestly and truly say it would be would be David Falk. Uh, you've done so many, what I would capture as historic things in your professional career. But before we get into those, let's kind of uh, walk back in the, to the younger years of David Falk. Talk to us about David Falk from the ages 15 to 20. And, and what was life like for you in those younger days? I grew up in a very middle-class environment in Long Island, New York, a little town called Seaford, me and Jimmy V. And uh, my father was a butcher. I never finished high school. My mother was a teacher with two master's degrees. Uh, we grew up in a very sort of blue-collar kind of a town. Most of my friends' and parents were skilled laborers. And um, I worked from the time I was nine years old. I worked in my dad's butcher shop. I was a busboy in a restaurant. I drove trucks. I uh, worked in warehouses. And so I always felt I've had an affinity for working people because that's really how I grew up. I always knew I wanted to go to college. Uh, and I had this very sort of naive idea that I wanted to be a lawyer. Don't ask me why. It was not, no one I knew that was a lawyer that was my mentor or anything. Just everyone told me I was good at arguing when I was young. I mean, that probably surprises you. <laughs> and uh, actually, in fifth grade, I had a, I had a, we had this thing in fifth grade where at the end of the year, people would bring these little, they call them autograph books. It was like a book with different colored paper, and people would write little things that, like, you know, too young to drink four roses. Mm -hmm. One, this guy, Greg Mallow, a fifth grade friend of mine, wrote, You should be a lawyer because you're a really good arguer. And that always sort of stuck in my mind. So I was always oriented at 15, 16 to go to college. I was a really good student. I don't say I worked very hard, so it came pretty easy to me. Uh, I was pretty, I played, played, I played ball every day. I wasn't that great at it, but I played at it every day. I played football in the fall, basketball in the winter, and, and baseball in the summer. And back then, unlike the way my kids grew up, you know, no one went to camp, you know, no one took music lessons. School ended, you did your homework, and you played ball. It was a pretty, pretty simple existence. What was your favorite sport? Basketball. Basketball is always my favorite. And did you play on the high school team? No, you know, I went out when I was a sophomore. I played every day, half court, three on three. And mm -hmm. I thought I was a pretty good player. And my parents never really pushed me into sports. And so I never really tried to play organized ball. When I was a sophomore, I went out. And it, it was like a, a, a negative epiphany. I don't know what you call a negative epiphany. I realized I didn't know how to play basketball. <laughs> <laughs> I was a good shooter. You know, I sort of had a sense of the game. But three on three and full court were... I really didn't learn to play until I was in law school, and I, and I went to a summer camp at the Poconos, and the athletic director who just won the New York City Championship, and you know, he taught us set plays and stack offenses and stuff, and I said, God, this really is basketball. <laughs> so, I, but I loved it. I played it every day. I enjoyed it um, literally every day, probably for about four or five months a year, and I really followed it. When I was a kid, I was a big Lakers fan. Jerry West, Elgin Bell was my two idols. Uh, I lived in New York, and I rooted, rooted for the Lakers. Was tough. Wow. In those early years, David, who were your role models and your mentors? My mother. My mother was my was my chief mentor. Uh, she was um, she was a first generation American. Her dad came over from from Poland. Uh, he was a scholar, uh, sort of in the old country, paid to be a student, and he came over here and uh, opened up a you know a retail business in, in, in the Bronx, New York, and he had five children and he pushed them relentlessly. He was a you know, he was a very, very driven man, and all five of his children were all very successful. My mother's side of them were all doctors and lawyers. Uh, I was very, very close to my mom. And um, my dad was like almost like the polar opposite. His whole family was all in the meat business. Nobody went to school. And so in a very sort of bizarre way, my mom pushed education because she was in it. My dad pushed education because he didn't have it. Mm -hmm. uh, and. And through that all, I was a pretty self-motivated person, so I think I would have probably been pretty much the same, you know, with different parents. But but my mom was absolutely, she stressed education, language. Uh, she, was a, she was a language teacher. She spoke about six or seven languages. Uh, she worked with Nelson Rockefeller during World War II in the Department of Latin American Affairs here in Washington tra as a translator. And, uh, and she, you know, she was really a joy to be around. Very, very, very demanding. I came home from... Uh, 
came home from high school with my first college boys at uh, just under 1400 and she didn't talk to me for a month. She was so, <laughs> she was so mad at me. For, it was like, for her, I was like, fail. You know, she yeah. didn't understand how I could do so far. I was like in the top 2% and she was just angry. Wow. Then you look back on those, those years, uh, particularly those early years as you were growing up as a young person and then going on to Syracuse. And you look back now, what was some of the best advice your mom and dad gave you that even to this day uh, helped mold who David Falk has become? Yeah, my mom had a lot of expressions. Actually, my both parents, my, my dad had been in the Army for five years, so he had a number of like, Army expressions, like <laughs> hurry up to wait, you know, things like that. But, you know, my mom, as I said, always stressed education. She, she wrote she wrote my autograph book when I, when I graduated from elementary school. A little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Drink deep, my son. Mm -hmm. And she had an expression that was sort of my mantra growing up. She always used to say, shoot for the stars and never settle for second best. And so people over the years who have critiqued me in different, in different fields, whether it's marketing or contracts, and they say that I'm arrogant or I'm greedy, whatever, if they really knew me, it was just trying to please my mom. I was just trying to follow her advice. And I guess I've never really been satisfied. I'm a very driven person. You know, I'm, a, I'm a compulsive perfectionist. And that's really, that's really what I learned and was, and was mentored by my mom, to always strive to be better. When I met Michael and his parents first year, I saw so many parallels. His parents always pushed him. You know, that's what you were close with them. And no matter what he did, they, they continued to urge him to grow. They were never satisfied, you know, being work of the year, being the leading scorer. They wanted him to get smarter, broader, and grow. And in a very bizarre way, it reminded me of my own, my own background. So that's that's my mentor. That's that's the person that's driven me. I'd say my male mentor has probably been John Thompson. I've said that publicly many times. I don't think I've learned as much from any man I've ever met as I've learned from John. And that's two of us. Yeah. Okay. And it's it's so ironic for me because he's paid me over the years, you know, a lot of money to be his advisor. And I think I've learned a lot more from his advice than he's probably learned from mine. Uh, and uh, in so many different areas. You know, he's a very uh, insightful person. I think he's like a PhD in human nature. He really understands people. He has an ability to size up a very complex situation and, and have a very, very simple, cogent, you know, response to how you should, how you should deal with things. I've learned a tremendous amount from him about, you know, racial relationships. Uh, he's attuned me as a white person to things that I wouldn't think about otherwise. And uh, I absolutely, you know, I love the man. People ask me, who's your hero in life? And I always say that John's my hero. So David Falk comes out of law school. He's now going to pursue a career in law. What, 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 at what point did you realize that, that there was a, a, a golden opportunity or a significant opportunity for you in, in the sports marketing business? Well, when I was in college, my first day of school, I showed up at Syracuse, and despite an absolute fluke of fate, I was put on the dome floor with the two-star freshman recruits. So back then, in the age when basketball was played with a square ball, <laughs> they, and freshmen couldn't play. These, I had these two you know, star freshmen on my team that are very dear friends of mine to this day, Greg Coles and Paul Petrowski. I love basketball. I go to practice with them. You know, we talk basketball. We have basketball magazines. And I had this very naive notion that maybe I could go to law school and combine my desire to be a lawyer with my love of basketball. By the time I became a senior, Greg actually got drafted uh, by the NBA. Uh, late, I knew I didn't have a clue what, what to do if he would have said, okay, let's do it. Like a lot of the young people do today, you know, they turn over to their friends and say, okay, represent me. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't even know what to do. So when I went to law school, I started networking early on, maybe the end of my first year. And I met Larry Fleischer in New York, who founded the NBA Players Association, and met Bob Wolf in Boston, who's one of the you know, legends mm -hmm. of, the, of the business. I met a few, I met a guy named Phil McLaughlin, who was a financial advisor who represented Red Auerbach. And, uh, I met a guy here in Washington named Hamilton Carruthers, who was the predecessor to Paul Tiger, who was the lead counsel for the, for the NFL players, so, uh, for the NFL league. Uh, I met the head of the general counsel for Major League Baseball. And everybody I met said, if you want to get into this business, we're not hiring, it's very small. You know, Syracuse and UW doesn't blow us away. You should be 
is a guy in Washington, Donald Dell, who represents tennis players. You should, you should meet him. And so, uh, in my second my second year of school, after after a month of calling this guy and getting every excuse you could possibly get from himself, he said, "Buzz, he was out of town. He's going to climb. He was in the bathroom." You know, one day I just got really fed up, and I called him seventeen times. I called him every ten minutes. And when the secretary ran out of excuses, he finally gave me an interview. Kept me waiting four hours for the interview. Uh, and they told me they weren't hiring people, so I offered to work for free uh, after my second year of law school. So I had a full-time job in the day working for a large law firm here in town called Sibley and Austin, which is the Washington branch of a very large Chicago firm. And uh, I worked there from you know, 9 to 6. And when I got done, I walked across the street. I worked at ProServe from, from 6 to 11 for free. Wow. And incredible. David, who was your first client? My first actual client was a tennis player named Hank Fister, who was a six foot four raw bone kid from Bakersfield, California. Uh, and my first basketball client was John Lucas. But to put it in perspective, George, I didn't recruit John Lucas. I didn't negotiate his first deal. The senior people in the firm did that. Uh, and then they turned to me and said, okay, here's the deal. You write it up. You write up this contract. And they didn't want to manage them. Like they wanted to do the deals and turn it to the next order of business. So I was you know, I was 25 years old, and they said, here's John Lucas, Wally Walker, and Adrian Dabby, the one-fifth, five, and six picks in the draft. And I, I was happy to do what they called babysitting. You know? And at that time, because the salaries were so low, 1976 was the year the two leagues merged, the ABA merged with the NBA. So Lucas made about 300, and, and Dabby and Wally made about 100 each a year. And so when John wanted to change the tires for his car, I would call about five car dealerships in Houston and see if I can get them a cheaper rate. You know, today you try to make sure the guys don't buy three Bentleys. Yeah. Then, you worry about, you know, if you're paying $75 for a tire. So it was very, very hands-on. And uh, I was in seventh heaven, you know, doing whatever whatever it was they asked me to do. So I had, I had a bunch of basketball clients, I had some tennis clients, and then in 77, we had our first football clients, a local guy from Coolidge named Michael Butler. It was the seventh uh, ninth pick in the draft, and so I uh, you know, I worked hundred hours a week. Uh, I made almost no money. I made less than most of the secretaries in the firm. I started out making thirteen thousand dollars my first year, and and uh, and I worked at ProServe from 19, 1974 to nineteen through nineteen ninety one, and I made less money than I made in the first two years of being on my own combined. What motivated you to continue to pursue this career when, when the compensation uh, wasn't exactly uh, what you now realize for, for uh, negotiation? I, mean, I was doing something I loved. And uh, it, you know, it's very hard for people on the outside side to understand how people on the inside feel. Uh, and for me, the money never motivated me. You know, I, just, I, I was doing my dream job. I was in sports, working for law firm, working for the best players in the world. I was like a junior agent for Arthur Ashe and Stan Smith, doing grunt work, scheduling, you know, reviewing their endorsement contracts, checking to make sure the royalty payments were accurate. Uh, I wrote every contract in the firm, wrote thousands of them, became really good at it. Uh, and uh, I just, I was doing something I loved, and the money was really secondary. You know, I, I wasn't really thinking about the money. Uh, I just knew I was... I was doing something I loved, and, and you can't put a price on it. Mm -hmm. Of all the deals that you've negotiated over the years, what are one or two that you're the most proud of? Well, I think from the endorsement side, obviously, the, the Air Jordan deal. I, mean, I think that's been the, the most successful relationship probably in sports history between an athlete and a company. Uh, and I'm proud of that because it's very difficult in 2011 people to understand that in 1984, the idea that a player could come out, a rookie, untried, untested, no matter how good he was in college, and get his own line of products in football and basketball, had never happened before. Magic didn't have it, Bird didn't have it, Dr. K didn't have it, no one had it. And so it was innovative. And I had developed a very close relationship with Rob Strasser and Nike over literally over a 10-year period. And we got to the point where we wouldn't even negotiate the deals. So I would just tell him, here's who we have. And he'd say, what do you think is fair? And I would tell him, and we shook hands. We had very, very little negotiation. We had a very close working relationship. And, and uh, 
I sort of found Nike because the company I worked for actually represented Adidas in America. Uh, one of the senior guys worked with Converse, so there was no room for me with those companies. I was, I was looking for my own niche. And, and, uh, and Nike was probably a $3 million company when we got started. And um, Strasser turned me down for the first five deals I recommended. And I told him, if you turn me down for number six, I'm not going to propose anymore. The sixth guy was, was Adrian Depp. I signed Adrian to a deal. Put him in the Nike Pro Club. He was a great player, mm-hmm. very hard worker. Uh, and so that sort of set the table in, uh, in 1984. I think on the contract side, uh, I say probably Patrick Ewing's rookie deal, which I think was sort of the Air Jordan version. Uh, we invented a thing called the early termination option, which allowed a player to have a guaranteed contract for a number of years but terminate it early, but never existed in sports before. He made 50% more money. He made 50% more money than any that player had ever made. Let me turn this off for you. Oh, that's right. Uh, in the history of the league, Jabbar was the highest paid player in NBA history when Patrick came out in 1985. The highest paid rookie had been Olajuwon, who made $1.2 million. The year before, Patrick made $3.2 million. And we signed him to a long deal with early termination, and it was, uh, it was unprecedented. And Patrick was probably the first superstar player that I really signed in my own. You know, Michael Jordan came to it because Donald Dullard had a relationship with my boss at the time, with Coach Smith, and they had a lot of Carolina players. Um, I signed I had signed some players early on my own, but nobody, Patrick Stature and John Thompson, you know, showed a lot of confidence in me by recommending recommending Patrick to us. And when we got the contract for him, I felt really sort of vindicated, you know, that I justified his confidence. And those those were groundbreaking deals, those two deals, I think they changed, they changed the industry. David, let's step back again to the Jordan deal. Uh, from a historic perspective, we look back on that deal today, and the untold story in my mind is that this was a Fortune 500 company, although they weren't at that time, that took a, a, a black person and made them the face of their company. And, and, and uh, at, at, at that time, I, I'm, I'm sure that wasn't Nike's intent, even though there was, a, there was a risk factor there. But we look back today, and you were a part of an even uh, uh, maybe more historic circumstance in that here was the first time that a major corporation in America had taken a black man and made them the face of their, of their company. Yeah, I think that happened. I don't think that happened initially in 1984. I don't think that was Nike's intent to make Michael the face. It was my intent to have him, him separated out from from all the rest of the players. You know, I I, I told that to Rob Thorne, who's the general manager of the Bulls, when they drafted Michael. And the shoe first came out, and Rod said to me, "David, is this a smart play? You're sort of treating Michael like a tennis player. You're sort of separating him out from the team." I said, "That's exactly the game plan. We don't think that Michael's like." A typical rookie. We think he's got a, a unique ability, you know, to, to market a product. Um, the fact that he was African American, that was the hand I was dealt. It wasn't my intention to try to be a civil rights advocate. And at the same time, you know, there was a lot of pushback from, from, from not from Nike, from a lot of the Fortune 100 companies that we pitched them to, because there had been no precedent. There had not been a team athlete who was African American that had that kind of general success in the marketplace. And so people were asking me, what do we do with a black basketball player? I would say, well, don't black people go to McDonald's or don't they drink Coca-Cola? Um, and we had to find channels. Uh, we had to develop channels sometimes to go through minority marketing um, portions of the company. And we used the power of the company that I worked for. We represented Jimmy Connors and did some very large players outside of basketball. And a lot of times we just leveraged them said, if you want to sign this person, we want you to take Michael. Some of the early deals were tiny. I mean, the first McDonald's deal was, was 25000 in Chicago, 25000 in North Carolina. And while nobody would believe this in 2011, after the second year of the deal, McDonald's had an option to take him national. The woman who ran the state of North Carolina for McDonald's didn't want to renew the deal because she couldn't, couldn't come up with ideas of how she could market Michael Jordan in North Carolina. Really well. <laughs> I think she ended up in, like, Louisiana or something, <laughs> but it was, and the reason I said it wasn't, it's because it 
it was it was a case of first impression. No one had experience. Today, when guys like LeBron or Kobe come out, it's like automatic. You're gonna go with Nike or Adidas, Coke or Pepsi, Gatorade or Powerade. I mean, it's almost no imagination to it. Back then, it was groundbreaking, and the fact that he was African American, we were able to break down a lot of barriers in corporate America to using an African American person as you put as the face of a product. And in, in hindsight, not in foresight, I'm very proud of that. I mean, it wasn't my intention, but I think that was the result. David, on a number of occasions over the years, I've had people say to me that the absolute uh, uh, expert on this NBA salary cap is is uh, David Falk. In fact, when someone said to me that David could could could, could put out a manual. On the, on the NBA salary cap. How, how did you acquire that reputation? Well, I'm, as a lawyer, you know, I'm trained to read contracts. It's a little bit like having the tax code of being an accountant. And, and you, your job is to understand where the gaps are in the code that you can exploit for advantage to your clients. So, you know, for example, uh, in the early years of the cap, Let's say we go up 30% from one year to the next. The early years, the growth of the cap drew to explosive. And I looked at it and said, if I have a client who goes in the top five picks in the draft and the cap's going up 30%, he should probably go up 60% over the player of the year before. And the team would say, why? I said, because, because the impact of a guy in the top five is dramatically different than the impact of a guy who goes 25. So if the average rate of increase is 30%, the star should probably be at 60, and the bottom guy should be at zero, and the guys in the middle may be at 10 or 15. And we use the cap as a barometer for the salaries. And so from a period of time, probably from Patrick Ewing in 85 through through the weight scale in 1995, our clients on average probably made 17% more than comparable guys in, in, their, in their slotted positions in the draft. And, and during that period of time, we came up with a number of innovations. Every time we come up with someone new, Gary Dutton, who's the head of legal for the NBA, would reject it. And I said, what rule are we breaking? He said, no rule, but I just think you're violating the spirit of the cap. I said, I want to arbitrate. And he said, why? I said, because in the worst case, I'll lose. This is a position I'm already in when you tell me you're going to reject it. In the best case, I'm going to have a new exception. And so I had a stack in my, in my desk of arbitration requests with <laughs> Dutton, and we changed a lot of the rules. That's where the early termination came from. The right to player options. We, we we invented all that stuff on the fly to try to to try to find creative ways. Back then there was no weight scale. You could be very creative in the contracts. Today there's only three sentences in the whole contract you're allowed to change in the whole uniform contract. Wow. So when people say I'm hiring a lawyer and having them review the contract, if that review takes more than thirty seconds, <laughs> one paragraph you can change a love of the game clause, which we invented for Michael, which allows the player to play out of season. One paragraph. Um, says the player doesn't need permission to sponsor products, which used to be paragraph 17, maybe 16 now. And one says that if the team feels he's out of physical condition, you can have an independent party review it. That's the only three things you're allowed to change in the entire contract. But back then, we would take the contract and cross it all out, almost every part of it, and write an addendum, 20, 30 page addendum. So you'd show up at a press conference with a poor GM who wasn't a lawyer. And he hadn't even had a chance to read this thing, and they announced it at the sign of the player. He said, initial here, initial here. And we, we treated him with respect. We were not trying to get over on it. But there was a lot more flexibility back then to showcase your skills, both as a negotiator and as a lawyer. Today, it's so mechanical, it's like being a plumber. Mm. David, let the, well, once again, uh, there's so much history around your, 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 your historic deal with Michael Jordan and Nike. There, there's a story that after Nike put the proposal on the table to you and Michael uh, and his parents, that Michael went to Adidas and told them, if you match this deal, I'll still sign with you. Is there any truth to that? Absolutely. I, I wasn't aware of it at the time. I, I learned that a long time later on. Michael had won Converse in North Carolina, but he loved Adidas and he got in front of me with a Adidas, local Adidas rep named Gary Stoken, uh, and he told the Adidas people he wanted to sign with them. As I indicated earlier, ironically, our company, ProServe, at the time, had a working relationship with Horst Dossler, who ran Adidas, was the son of the founder, Adi Dossler, and, and he had died, and so the company was sort of in disarray at the time. They didn't have the, they just didn't have the, the resources, uh, 
and marketing to make the deal work. Um, I always wanted to go with Nike because I thought Nike needed them the most. I thought Nike would be the most aggressive marketing them because they were really a distant third in 1984 in basketball. Converse dominated the American basketball scene. Adidas probably had the best product uh, and certainly had an elite, an elite status. And Nike, you know, Nike was just in its infancy in, in basketball. And I don't think the product was remotely as good as it is today. And I thought that that spelled to me, that spelled opportunity. What I, what I demanded from Nike, way beyond the money, was we demanded that they give him his own line and they spend a million dollars the first year promoting. Now, people say, God, they would a million dollars. We wouldn't do one television commercial. The players didn't have commercials back then. And we, we had a, a launch of his product of Air Jordan, in, I think in eight cities as a rookie. And we had the famous poster of him ducking over the skyline in Chicago, which became a jump man. And, uh, and so it was my strong desire that he be with Nike. It was Michael's strong desire that he be with Adidas. And so he, on his own, you know, gave them every opportunity to do it. And thank God they weren't able to do it. I think that would have been, would have changed the course of basketball marketing history. I think they got with Patrick went with Adidas the following year. Uh, and after about three years, they, they terminated the deal. They, they just weren't able to implement it. They didn't have the, they didn't have the American know-how. It was primarily a European company at the time. Uh, and ironically, as you know, Rob Strasser took it over down the road to try to make make it much, much more American. The product identification, Air Jordan, talk to us how that became, uh, that came into existence. Well, when I, when I visited with Rob, and I said, look, if you want to sign this player, Michael Jordan, you know, you have to give us all line of products. And he said, we may be willing to do that, but we're not going to call it Michael Jordan. And I said, well, why not? And he said, because Michael has no credibility as a designer, he's a basketball player. And in 1984, it was sort of the end of a long era where designers were putting their names on all sorts of products, jeans, sunglasses, cars, and Rob thought that the American public was sort of saturated with the sort of designer craze and it wouldn't work in basketball with a, with a basketball player who wasn't a designer. And so I'm sitting there thinking, how do you have your own autograph line if you can't use your name? How do you identify it? And Rob said, that's your, that's your challenge. You come up with a way to identify it, and we'll give you a line. And so as we were sitting there in an August afternoon in my office with no air conditioning on a Saturday, you know, I started going through ideas. I'm a little bit of a cornball when it comes to ideas. And um, I said, how about Air Jordan? Because Nike just started the air technology for, for track and nothing to do with basketball. And Michael obviously was a player who played in the air. Peter Moore, who was the designer at the time, took out a sketchbook and drew the right as we're talking, drew the, the first logo with the with the wings and uh, the basketball and road. And there it was, Eric Jordan was born. Now, since then, you know, I've read stories of other people who've taken credit for coming up with Eric Jordan, <laughs> other people who said they negotiated the deal, which I, I guess it's like the Russians inventing baseball. Even my former boss has given interviews saying that, you know, that he, he negotiated Michael's first deal, which is news to Michael and I. I would feel like, but you know, I know that I know that Michael knows who did it. And that's all that really matters to me. David, looking back over the years, who would you say was the toughest person you negotiated against, and who was the toughest company that you negotiated against? That's a great question. You know, I think I'd say I, I think that Jerry Reinsdorf may be one of the one of the toughest. I think he's a very bright guy. I really like him. Was the owner of the Bulls and the White Sox. Um, you know, I think after a while, though, when you have great players and the people you negotiate with respect you, none of it's really tough. It's, what's tough is when you're when you're pioneering new ground. When Michael signed his deal as a free agent in 1996 for 30 million. You know, you think about it. 15 years have gone by. No player in the NBA said 30 million. You know, if you go back 15 years before Michael, you know, from 19 96 to 1981, players are making 200,000. So it's hard to believe that no one's caught up in, in 15 years. So, and that was the whole purpose of the deal. But for if you're Jerry Reinsdorf and you're stepping out in totally uncharted territory, you know, putting a player in, in the 30 million dollar range, it makes the deal difficult. You know, you don't want to embarrass the owner. Um, at the same time, you want to try to put the greatest player of all time in a position that he's earned. 
he should be on a pedestal where no one else is close to him. And so when he was you know, ten million dollars a year higher than the next closest guy, I, I thought that was appropriate. But it makes the deal hard. I think when you go into a company in the, in the early '80s and and basketball's having a lot of difficulties on Madison Avenue, people think the league is too much to the drugs. They think the league is too African American um, on Madison Avenue. And you're trying to sell a young player who hasn't played a single game, you know, and becoming a corporate spokesperson. You know, that's a challenge. And I'm a person, I love challenges. I mean, I think the reason that I get along so well with my clients is because while I can't play worth a lick, I think that they recognize I have the same competitiveness in business that they have on the court, and that I think it forms a certain kind of a bond.